question for 20 minutes. Please, welcome your own, please. All right. So thank you, everybody. I'm Jung Willemsen. I'll talk a bit about it later. Um, uh, my talk is about creating apps like Pipeline of containers in a week and how we feel and succeeded. Now, first of all, I would like to know about you guys. Is Who of you has a CICD pipeline? Can you raise your hands? That's actually pretty good. How many of you have a security automation pipeline on top of that? All right, for you, I'm sorry, the talk might not be as inter Oh, sorry. The talk might not be that interesting then because I wanted to create a lightweight talk to inspire people that don't have it yet. Um, but don't feel bored too much. You can always ask me questions later on or um, interrupt me when necessary to show off that it can be done way better. All right, a little bit about me. I'm Jeroen Willemsen. Uh, I come from the Netherlands. That's why the name. Um, right now, I fulfill the role of a security architect. I have a long background in full stack development on mobile, doing uh, web apps, creating scalable backends in several languages and stuff like that. And I've always had a knack for mobile security, as in how do you secure some content on a mobile device? How do you make sure you can interact with it safely and stuff like that? So, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the challenge, the solution, the bumps on the road that we found, and then we're going to do a short recap. One thing I have to say, we did this at the end of 2016, so that's where this talk is about. We had a week then, and you probably attended some of the talks today and yesterday about the new tooling, and it became absolutely far more brilliant. So the stuff that you're going to see might be a bit dated, and you could have done it much better if you used modern tooling or the modern versions of the tools that we talk about. But still, I hope this will inspire you to see that it's not that hard to do it anyway, given either the older tooling or the newer ones, all right? So, the challenge. Um, we basically had to automate security, was the request. And the customer asked us, how much time do you need? And we figured we might be able to do something in a week. Let's see how far we can come. So we started off with just me and my colleague to see what we could do there. Uh, basically, we spend about 34 hours on the project, and this is the result we're going to talk about. So, let's just first talk about what had to be automated. So, there is a bunch of legacy systems there, which are for some warehouse management, some fleet management stuff that you can't just dockerize. I mean, you know, your scanner with which you could scan a packet somewhere in a warehouse, that's not going to run in a Docker container somewhere else. But So, there's some legacy systems there. On top of that, there's a bunch of Amazon web services. So there's a bunch of Docker containers running, providing functionality, modern APIs for an Angular application, an Android native application, and an iOS application. So that was the landscape we had to do something with. So how was that stuff being built? Let's focus a bit on the backends first. So, well, most of you know how this works, right? You start with Jira, developers together with the PO, create stories, etc., etc. Based on that, they start creating uh, uh, feature branches and stuff, that's the flow that Git flow that they normally use. They would annotate those with the stories so that everybody would know why the code was there in general. And then we start with the beautiful containers. So we use a stateless Jenkins uh, uh, container where we use the job DSL to just parse everything and automate everything away. And what it would do every now and then, given a C job, take all the projects, um, then start doing pools on every other project, start figuring out the merges and stuff like that. And based on that, it would start uh, the pipeline by building and that building was of course including quality tooling all the jazz which you've seen in other talks as well so let's not concentrate on that one right now then it would store an artifact so it could be a war file a jar file or uh, some other program or an angular uh, uh, set of files for an angular application stuff like that or a docker container where everything will be in residing and then it would deploy the containers containing these artifacts to death, to death. in the meantime um, Based on that artifacts, a bunch of unit tests will be run. And of course, based on the deployment, they would do a set of end-to-end -end tests to see whether this worked or not. And then when everything was very green and stuff, um, you would have a new instance on developer ready for, uh, uh, for validation. All right? So that's uh, pretty basic. And it worked very well, because um, obviously you had the standard quality controls in there. So when uh, in Git, you could do the, uh, the code reviews and stuff like that. So there was already quite a lot there before we arrived. And you really need such a thing before you can continue working. Otherwise, why automate security if development hasn't been automated yet? Uh, so what did we have to add up to that? 
Well, first of all, we started adding the uh, OAuth dependency checker. That's what we had to add and a few other dependency checkers for third-party vulnerabilities. A bunch of license checkers to verify that we weren't violating some of the internal policies of the company because they had a comp uh, policy on what licenses they do accept for third-party uh, resources and what they do didn't. And normally people had to manually grab that. And that was a cumbersome thing. You don't want that. And then we started to do something with Docker security in general. Obviously, there's a lot of tools you can use. We just had to use one back then to start getting at least some, some minimal insights on what might be possibly wrong. Um, and we use Claire for that. Who of you knows Claire? All right, for those who doesn't know, Claire is basically an inspector tool that uh, is part of a larger commercial tool suite, but this one has been, the tool itself has been open sourced. It will use a set of vulnerability databases as resources to uh, then verify the layers within a Docker container to see if some of the known vulnerabilities could be linked to that and then report on that, which makes it relatively easy to just, when you create your container, then offer it to Claire and could just dissect the layers and then tell you what possibly might be wrong there. Of course, this is a theoretical thing because after all, those vulnerabilities might be there in one of the layers, but the layer on top of that might mitigate that. So you will get some problems there, but at least you get some basic insight on what might be possibly wrong with the container. And at the point that we started, the customer had no clue about it. Everybody just created their containers, start deploying. So this would give a basic insight. Um, next, of course, well, you know them, right? Zap and Burp. Some other tooling, which is less important. And we wanted to do also static source code analysis, but um, who of you is familiar with Scala? Not too many, actually. So Scala is a high scalable language, which is actually by itself a scalable language because you can provide uh, AppSec syntax trees on top of that, a bunch of cool macros, and then basically you can read kind of your own language. That's not something a SAS tool is going to understand right now, because the hard part of this is that there are some tools like Checkmarks and Fortify that support the basics of it. But the moment a developer goes wild, you'll see that it's going to miss out a lot. So we figured let's not buy one something and continue. The other um, hard uh, player in the field was this little buddy. Who knows that icon? Recognizes it? No. Swift? Yeah, exactly. Swift. So um, we have a bunch of mobile developers in that team that always like to use the latest and great stuff, basically. Well, that's not where your SAS tooling is optimized for. So yeah, here you go. You have to go all runtime in there. Or at least that's what we had to do. Of course, you could say as the bad police, um, thou shall not use latest and greatest, but be a bit, you know, less progressive. But that wasn't the company culture. So we couldn't do that just like that. All right. So, well, what was the solution? Basically, we got there kind of. First of all, to get feedback as soon as possible, you have to add dependency and license checkers on top of the quality tooling you already have. With tooling, it can be configured in a way that really makes sense. So, a Maven plugin for your Maven build pipeline, uh, a, JS uh, a JavaScript plugin for your uh, build pipeline. Make sure it's really simple and easy for developers to understand and give that feedback fast, because this is very easy. This is a quick win, they can always check out. And then if you take a look at the earlier container, basically what you add over here is Claire, that's not really that important. But the hard part is, of course, now that you have all this, is now you have to basically tell Zap and Burp, before you can use it, how the, well, uh, how the applications are working. Well, there was a beautiful presentation before me, it just showed that you no longer have to do that that way. But at the end of 2016, you kind of had to. Sorry about that. So, um, yeah, we basically had to teach the API using the end-to-end -end integration tests. And then test coverage became a thing because all of a sudden we from security had a really big opinion about the end-to-end -end integration test. Because if you wouldn't test that, we wouldn't know. So off you go, start testing. And actually the POs love this. That's a good thing. And then after that, you could just... Uh, kick off a quick scan with uh, using uh, uh, the REST APIs. At least for Zep, we were able to do that. For Burp, we just grayed it out a bit, and I'll get back to that later why. That's part of the failure, basically. Um, and then you would have a artifact running on Dev that would be scheduled for a longer scan afterwards. So then Zep could do a full scan, and we could see what else is in there. Um, so this is basically the setup. As I already discussed, in uh, up to Java and Git, everything was already fairly annotated, so you could track why some code is in there. 
So all we had to do was make sure that the moment that you would kick off Zap and you would then report to Fatfix, so yeah, we chose Fatfix back then, uh, at least the, the open source version, compile ourselves, put it in a container, start running. Um, and then we could just verify because of the, uh, the stuff that would be kicked out uh, and um, we could uh, augment the report basically to make sure that in ThreadFix you could still see uh, to which Git branches belonged and by that it wasn't too hard to track back what causes it in the first place. Of course this is a very disciplined approach because this means that the developer should never ever do something else and always annotate this Git commit, uh, commit with the right uh, Jira ticket. So luckily you can do this far better right now, but then again this is how it was back then. The harder part of course was that um, Zap would just give some feedback which would be stored by Jenkins in S3 bucket which is unfiltered. So if it found something which was a false positive, the developer would immediately already be warned by that. So we basically had to give a pass through there. That was a bit of a sad thing. The other thing, of course, is that once you did get the results, you have to feed, back, uh, feed that back to Jenkins again, um, filtered. So there is some delay there. Luckily, the moment you set up your basic false positive filtering, because the first uh, long scans will provide you a lot of data on which is either right or wrong. Uh, so you can start suppressing the false positives from there onward, and then stuff actually gets better. But the first one is the expensive one. And then after that, we will use ThreadFix to just submit uh, stories to Jira. Obviously, after talking to the developers. One thing that a developer, at least I, when I'm developing, really dislike is if some other guy starts just adding uh, stories to my backlog because, you know, I as a developer need to be in control of that and I don't care what security thinks. I need to deliver value. Let me do that. But if the security guy sits next to me at the moment that, you know, some standard moment in a week, unless it's a high vulnerability, it starts talking to me like, hey, I'm sorry, but look at the computer. This is what we found. Um, and we have to do something about that. Can we please, uh, can I provide you a story and then you can, and then we can refine it together later on, later on and just make it work. And it worked pretty well. So yeah, talk first, integrate later. So although this is all automated now, you really need to stay in touch with your developers, but more about that later. So we also did, um, um, ran care on, uh, Claire on the create containers, uh, but we obviously couldn't finish everything. We haven't integrated with ThreadFix because we could just create some JU.xml file, put the results in there, as you of course have to parse the results from Claire because we'll get to that later how that looks. It's not a JU report, so you have to convert that. Um, and of course we had to add whitelists, so you could reassert that for some containers, those vulnerabilities that didn't make sense would be filtered out but at least we had something to work with, right? We got some basic ideas. Um, and all of our tools were embedded in containers. So you could say, here's the Amazon VPC, start running them over there, that's fine. Or you could run them locally. So you don't add another platform complexity because it makes it fairly easy to handle. And you can run it anywhere. So you could do local tests, but you could also deploy it to your Amazon uh, infrastructure and just run it over there. And it's easy to scale. So you can have multiple Zap containers for different applications, so you can do scans in parallel, stuff like that. Although this does cost something, because the Zap scan isn't for free. There's a lot of calculations going on, and that's a price that you have to pay. Um, of course, you still need to manage the data. So when you use a ThreadFix container, for instance, it still needs to feed the data to something else, like a SQL uh, uh, database. So for that, we use the standard facilities from Amazon to store it there. And otherwise, we would run it locally, you had to somehow export that and then start doing some local tests with that. So that was a bit of a thing. And basically, we just create our own containers, therefore adding stuff in the infrastructure that might contain their own vulnerabilities. Um, so it's not perfect, we still have to harden it. And you can see that when we run Claire. So this is our test app, slash ThreadFix which are written on a local uh, version of the uh, Claire scanner. And to do this properly, because we had like a week, so you go a bit into scripting mode, so we needed nine layers on top of each other to make this work. And probably everybody with experience in Docker has an opinion about that, but we just had to make it work and make it pretty afterwards. Um, and there was only actually one, uh, one vulnerability in there because we used uh, wget to get the stuff. And it was only used when creating the container, so 
the moment this is exposed, it's very short, and afterwards you can ditch it. So that's all fine and game. Um, but still, it was in there, so you had to think about, okay, do we remove it or not? So as you can see, we only just started, and already this was added there. So those who have experience with Claire, you probably see that even though you have nine layers, that's a very few vulnerabilities, right? I mean, there's a bunch of tools in there. There should be something else broken, right? Anybody? Nope. So um, basically what will happen is if you create very thin custom layers with some specific tooling in there with which uh, Clary doesn't really get what's going on there and can't match it to its databases, you won't get anything. So even though you get the basic idea of your uh, operating system and the standard tooling you install, it's, it won't tell you anything about the custom tooling. So you can't put your faith in it as in this is the end gate state. No, it's the starting point, but at least you have something. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Don't forget the fact that you're using custom layers. So it did work. That was a great thing. We had a basic thing. We had a basic pipeline. It actually provided some very cool feedback. Uh, we found a, um, a, a path reversal, uh, which was the most problematic one. Um, and uh, we found some reflected XSS issues. Uh, Obviously, we found some container issues with Claire, um, and we, we also found some false positives from Zap, like the basic cookie flags saying this should have been an HTTP only cookie, but a cookie was just there for some color based configuration of the Angular application. But well, then again, it worked. So within a week, you can actually get somewhere. Of course, not all components are in, but the feedback that we got, like this, is already of great value. We don't need to hire a pen tester to do this, we just did this by automation. It was just a starting point. So as you can see, it takes very little to get started. Of course, we had bumps on the road because it's an intense week, you have to do stuff. So the first one is, of course, you have to start filtering, especially with Claire. There's a lot of things you have to filter. Um, and of course, with uh, Zap, you also have to filter quite a lot. So we first thought about what if we have a plugin in Zap to make the filtering work, but that didn't work out quite well because it doesn't scale, especially per application. So we figured maybe we should have used the BDD security. Luckily, I had some experience prior to that and maintaining a feature file or a white or blacklist table in a distributed manner with other people means a lot more administration work on top of the table. So that's not gonna work out well. It will work if you have a few applications, but this should scale out in many applications. So we have to thought of, think of something else. So we figured let's try Threat Fix or Defect Dojo. Now, Defect Dojo has come a wonderful way in the last few months. Um, when we tried it out, it was in a state that was less um, beneficial. So that's why we went with FatFix, basically. But right now, I would say, depending on your what you have to do, choose anything you want to, because you're going to get there as long as you build the replace. Just like developers do, you should do too. Build your containers to replace them and make sure it's irrelevant what's going on there. So what would happen then is, of course, when we did the testing, there were a bunch of legacy APIs. So normally we had an Angular application talking through Nginx to some Scala backends, which would then either serve some content back or go to the, uh, the legacy API. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen, right? So the moment we hit that with some content from Burp, there we go. Uh-oh, we just broke it automatically. Cool. Um, that might not be a very good idea because that legacy system was quite hard to stop up, start up again. So we figured let's put something in between. Luckily, the development team already had something which we could extend. So we used Swagger API to create uh, to create some stub APIs to return some results that would have been returned by uh, the stubs, uh, sorry, by the uh, legacy system in general, and based on that, continue. Um, obviously, you can't then test the legacy API. You have to do that manually and with care in a certain time frame when you can. But at least you can fully start testing the Scala API. That's the most important thing. So I'm not to frustrate the developers. As I already noted a few times, give your feedback fast. The longer you wait with feedback, the more annoyed they are because they're working on another thing that you think they are. And that's completely natural. That's a good thing. So get there. Therefore, automate all the things. Don't, don't wait for something, don't do manual stuff unless you really have to, but start automating first to close the cycle ASAP. And be part of the team, like I talked before. Sit down with a developer, make sure you do the things together. And when you experiment with new tooling, ask a team if you can be part of that 
part of their sprint basically have your own branch to start integrating tooling have your own branch in the C job to make sure everything is abstracted away from them but at the same time they know that you're working on that so the moment they have some odd behavior they're not shocked because they know you're there and you're sitting next to them doing your thing of course filter and suppress false positives ASAP and use known tooling like I said before um, well, we couldn't, that's another failure, integrate Burp proxy completely. If you want to containerize that properly back then, you had to do a few additional things which weren't as pretty as we thought it would be, so we stopped doing that. Um, and the time of testing, we also needed additional extensions to have a proper REST API to talk to it, so we kind of figured, yeah, okay, at least we had that. That's a good starting point. Obviously, that this presentation should hold, not hold you back from integrating Burp later on, but at our time, it was a bit hard. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't mean no manual pen testing. So we created a simple policy on how to do that. We would have a gyro board from the security team. We would hire a guy to do it, give him a bunch of tasks to perform, so you could annotate those tasks when you would submit to FedFix or theoretically speaking, defect dojo, and then based on that, have new issues in Jira. At least you have the same flow, so everything gets centralized in your uh, vulnerability manager, because traceability is key here. Um, and even if you start adding more tools, because I think your pipeline will never be finished, you always have to add more, because the Fed landscape is moving, the technology stack is moving, we should be moving too. The moment you're stopping, you probably didn't think of something or your developers aren't doing anything. Um, but still, other than that, I still believe we need manual pen testing. And I might say it's a bit unfortunate because it would be lovely if computers can tell us everything, but this gives us the basics. And one last thing. When we joined to do that in a week, the just two days before, the platform became red so the Jenkins platform became relatively unstable unstable for some projects and that should be a key notification to you not to do it because you'll need support from your platform team to do this quickly otherwise you'll waste a lot of time reading up their code to see how it works for them and how you can best integrate and they'll always be stressed out so you can only talk to them mostly after office hours that's what we had to do to still get this right so Make sure you plan this with all the teams, so they're not doubly stressed because you're doing something and they're doing something. Take the context in consideration, and we security people, although requirement-wise might become one of the first, but platform-wise, we're pretty much one of the last ones, because we're not all automated yet, so it's not known to them. So, recap. Automate all the things, get feedback fast, containerize as much as possible to make it simple and be able to replace it easily, filter fast positives, um, stop your legacy APIs because you don't want to break them automatically, help developers and do not frustrate them. We as security people have to make sure that they're making the new value and it's been said multiple times in the conference and I can't agree on that. Um, we'll still need manual pen testing unfortunately. Um, get support of your platform team or of those people within the different uh, feature teams that will maintain the platform for you. And every part of the pipeline you're getting done is a blessing. Don't say we can't do that, this will take a few months, it's hard, blah, blah, blah. Start directly. The moment you hit home, you don't have anything yet, start experimenting, start creating something, because you'll need it eventually. And the moment you realize you've needed it, you're actually too late. Because by then, you should have been prepared by the scale up of the company you're working at. All right, that's it. Do you have any questions? Yes. So when you start, for instance, with you, oh yeah, sorry. Um, this gentleman over here asked me, uh, uh, could you give a circumstance why you would still need manual pen testing? Well, let's start with the, the tooling that we integrated, and one of them was Zap, but not too many dynamic analysis tools other than those. What could happen is that Zap was able to create a persistent cross-site scripting attack. Later on, got some HTML where that stuff was in, but never realized it was tied to that. So, yeah, we were able to do a persistent XSS across the application, but we would never realize that. So the automation would make the show, and this is just one small example. For those who've been at the very awesome talk 
met yesterday on the upstairs uh, from I forgot his name. Sorry about that. But about the uh, extra exploitable things in your browser, we don't have tools to detect this <laughs> right now, at least. So yeah, you'll need them. <laughs>